What we found in the files was a sweeping effort to reverse that promise and use machine learning and other tools to turn the internet into an inter instrument of censorship and social control. The ranking member of the Committee on the Weaponization of Government is asking for your sources. If I never asked them for their sources. Yes, I did, did not. Who gave you access to these emails? Um, Who was the individual that uh, gave you permission to access the emails? Well, the attribution from my story is sources at Twitter, and that's what I'm going to refer to. Okay. Uh, did Mr. Musk contact you, Mr. Taibbi? Again, the attribution from my story is sources at Twitter. So you're not going to tell us when Musk first approached you? Again, Congressman, when so you're you asking me to, yes you're no. asking a journalist to reveal so a source. So then you consider Mr. Musk to be the direct source of all this? No, now you're you're trying to get me to say that he is the source. The gentlelady's source. out of order. You don't and get to she's speak. she's out of order because he's interrupted. The gentlelady's not recognized. The gentlelady's not recognized. Chairman, you're not recognizing my time. He has not said that. I don't. But what he has said is he's not going to reveal his source. And the I fact that Democrats are pressuring him to do so is such an not. We're asking him about his conversation. Aha! People. Ordinary people. Hard drives can be manipulated by Rudy Giuliani or Russia. Well, what's I'd like all of you to think of me as a time traveler. An anti-Semitic great replacement theory allow rape and murder to be live streamed by terrorists on their platforms. Is that a threat? That's a problem. I can't. Well, then it was flagged for a reason. It gave me the creeps just reading about it. Depends on whether you're spreading inaccurate information. That's the threat. There's been a dramatic shift in attitudes about speech in this country, and many politicians now clearly believe the bulk of Americans can't be trusted to digest information on their own. Having come to this conclusion, the government agencies like the DHS and the FBI and the quasi-private agencies uh, who do anti-disinformation work have taken upon themselves the paternalistic responsibility to sort out for us what is and is not safe. While they see great danger in allowing others to read controversial material, it's taken for granted that they'll, they themselves will be immune to the dangers of speech. This leads to the one inescapable question about these new anti-disinformation programs that is never discussed but needs to be. Who does this work? Stanford's Election Integrity Project helpfully made a graphic showing the quote-unquote external stakeholders involved in their content review operation. It showed four columns, government, civil society, platforms, and media. There's one group that's conspicuously absent from that list. People, ordinary people. Nine months ago, I testified and provided evidence to the subcommittee about the existence of a censorship industrial complex, a network of government agencies, including the Department of Homeland Security, government contractors, and big tech media platforms that conspired to censor ordinary Americans and elected officials alike for holding disfavored views. I regret to inform the subcommittee today that the scope, power, and lawbreaking of the censorship industrial complex are even worse than we had realized back in March. I'd like all of you to think of me as a time traveler from the not too distant future, coming back to the present to offer you a glimpse of what could lie ahead for America. I live in a time in which, in the name of fairness, you can't share the stories you write for my news publication on social media. I live in a time in which, in the name of the common good, you can be kicked out of your bank and online payment system simply for expressing the wrong political views. I live in a time in which, in the name of social justice, you can commit a serious crime but get a more lenient sentence if you happen to be the right skin color. I live in a time in which, in the name of safety, you can be arrested for exercising your right to peaceful protest if you happen to be protesting the wrong thing. Of course, I'm not a real time traveler. I just live in Canada. The 29 witnesses have testified, and every single one testified, that the government never coerced, pressured, or threatened any social media company to remove any content. Mr. Taibbi, I introduced a letter um, that I led to X. Um, let's call it X now. That way we can know the difference between when Elon Musk took it over and before uh, when it was Twitter. Um, from November 21st. Have you read this? No. Well, <clears throat> do you think it would be problematic if X leaves up terrorist violence and propaganda in violation of the terms of service? Terrorist violence or terrorist prop propaganda? If it violates their terms of service, is it, is it problematic? Well, it depends on what the content is, but, um, you know, they're a private company. They can do what they want with the content. Aha! 
They're a private company and they can do what they want with the content. Do you think it's problematic that X would profit off of terrorist violent, violence uh, propaganda and content on their social media platform? Well, first of all, just to go back to no, the- No, no, just answer the question. I don't have time. Do you think it's a pro problem if, they're, if they profit off of it? Well, if, they, if the company makes money doing what it does, I don't, I don't necessarily see a problem with that. Okay, interesting. Um, and we know after interviewing Laura Demlo, who at the time of the Hunter Biden laptop story was on the Foreign Influence Task Force, she, we have learned from her that she and others on that task force did in fact know about the laptop before the New York Post story broke and they knew it was his. In other words, the work done in the year since the release of the Twitter files has continued to expose the extent to the censorship industrial complex. One of the most important things that it shows is that the censorship is in service of disinformation. It wasn't that they prevented the New York Post from publishing. It wasn't even that, that, that they did the tweet eventually did come back um, on Twitter is eventually allowed, but the disinformation that was planted that my, myself and all my family and friends believed was that there was something fraudulent about the Hunter Biden laptop, which we now know was actually the Hunter Biden laptop. It's been verified now by all the major media and everybody else. So, but it created the perception that it was uh, misinformation by the Russians. And of course, that conspiracy theory continues to be peddled today. Uh, what do you think about the fact that the FBI agents warning Twitter about a hack and leak were the same agents who knew that the, uh, of the existence and le legitimacy of that laptop? What do you think about those people? I, it's shock. I mean, it's sh I mean, I, I, like you said, I was trying to only report on what we knew at the time. But obviously, when that came out, it's absolutely shocking that you would have FBI sitting on this information in 2019 and then seeding the idea that there would be a hack and leak coming. I mean, it wasn't just Aspen Institute, it was also Stanford came out and they used that as a, pre, as a pretext to attack the Pentagon Papers principle upheld by the Supreme Court that when journalists like us are leaked information, we can publish it and we're protected by the First Amendment. An anti-Semitic great replacement theory was recently amplified on Twitter slash X by none other than its owner, Elon Musk, and the right-wing darling, Tucker Carlson. Terrorists used the platforms to terrorize target populations, and Hamas even used the personal accounts of hostages and victims to live stream their brutality to incite further violence. Mr. Taibbi, yes or no, should social media companies allow rape and murder to be live streamed by terrorists on their platforms in order to create fear and incite violence? I believe that would violate their terms of service, would it so, not? So your answer is no, it, it should not do, they should not be allowed to do that. Live stream rape and murder? No, right. I, think that, I think that would count as speech that would be prohibited under their terms. Good, service. good. You do have absolutist policies, um, but... At I least, do not have absolute... Least, I, do, I do not have... Please don't interrupt me. You have absolute... I've asked your question. You answered it. You do have absolutist policies. At least they have some limits, but I think a Homeland Security official... Um, with respect, if, if, if Congresswoman, a, if, all journalists me, operate under limits. my time. Limits. If a Homeland Security official echoed your opinion, you would call it censorship, but I'm glad that at least you acknowledge that rape and murder should not be allowed on social media platforms. Ms. Troy, I have the same question. Yes or no? Should, should social media companies take down brutal images of rape and murder live streamed by Hamas or similar groups like ISIS? Uh, I, I agree with uh, Mr. No, Ms. Troy. Oh, Ms. Troy. Ms. Troy. That's, you were looking at me. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, I believe they should follow their internal policies and they should absolutely not leave content up like that. And I can tell you as someone who worked on the Christchurch shooting where, the, where that terrorist live streamed the attack, which was hor horrifying, horrific, we did have conversations. We had official meetings with social media as an international community to discuss terrorist use of the internet and this violent rhetoric on there and what it would lead to potential more potential violence. You have no idea. You know you hard drives can that be it's a conspiracy? manipulated. Are you suggesting the New York Post participated in a conspiracy to construct the contents of the Hunter Biden laptop? No, sir. The problem is that hard drives can be manipulated by Rudy Giuliani or Russia. Well, what's the evidence that and that, that happened? What's well, there the is actual evidence of it, but the point is it's There's not no the evidence same thing. So you're engaging in a conspiracy. I'm glad. You so as someone who is familiar with White House officials, you can confirm that the Deputy Assistant to the President and Director of Digital Strategy, Rob Flattery, and the White House Senior Advisor, Andrew Slavitt, are indeed government officials and not social media executives, correct? Yes, when they were serving in, their, in the White House, they are government officials. Okay, so on February 6, 2021, at 9.45 p.m., I just love when we have timestamps and all this in writing. It helps tremendously. 
when Mr. Flattery emailed Twitter executives demanding the immediate removal of accounts linked to Biden's adult daughter, he stated, please remove this account immediately. He also stated, quote, I have tried to use your form three times. It won't work. I think this is ridiculous that I need to upload my ID to prove that I am an authorized representative of the president. Two minutes later, at 9.47 p.m., Twitter executives responded saying, thanks for sending this over. We'll escalate for further review here. He shot back. I cannot stress the degree to which this needs to be resolved immediately. Those accounts were then suspended and taken down. Now, fast forward about a month, Mr. Slavit. Biden's White House senior advisor said in writing, you know, it would be nice to establish trust with Twitter executives. Internally, we have been considering what our options are on what to do about non-compliance. Is that a threat? Would you consider that a threat from Biden White House officials to social media company executives to censor Americans' First Amendment rights? I think you would have to ask that question to them. I can't speak for what was intended by that message. If you were in that position, what would you do? Well... Actually, I can tell you because I've had conversations with social media companies during the Trump administration while on Mike Pence's office where I did call a social media company and we did uh, say, could you please take these photos down if possible because a U.S. missionary was killed brutally in Cameroon yeah. and Charles Wesco from Indiana, whose brother serves as a Republican in the end, Indiana state legislature, it was his brother who was killed brutally. And the ambassador from Cameroon, US ambassador, did weigh in and say, can we take these down while they circulate to notify the next of, next of kin before they see these horrific images of their father brutally murdered in a crossfire between two different opposing groups in Cameroon. Absolutely, Ms. Troy, that is, that is heartbreaking. Them. And we hold on, I've got to reclaim my images. time here. But so Ms. Troy, what answer? I'm saying is, Can I, I just present, answer? no ma'am, I presented you with a parody account that the White House had to take down, a parody. That is a very different situation than graphic photos of a tragedy. Would I you am, agree? I am speaking That's a simple yes or no. A situation where Ms. Troy, if you, cannot, if you cannot distinguish between a parody account and memes and jokes versus graphic photos, that's a problem. I can't speak to what they were referencing. I don't know. I just laid it out interest. for you, but I, I'll reclaim my time. Ms. Troy, you said, stated in your opening statement that this committee was indulging in fantasy detached from reality, that members of this committee and their witnesses make grand and vague accusations about government censorship and that we are spreading conspiracy theories about government censorship. Would one of those conspiracy theories be that government-funded agencies were flagging and trying to censor official congressional accounts on social media? Are you denying that that occurred? I would have no knowledge of that. I'm not aware of that. Happening. Well, we're going to make you aware of that right now. Mr. Schellenberger, uh, can... Can you speak to this tweet? I saw that you flagged this in one of your recent uh, articles on Substack. Can you, can you tell us uh, why this tweet brought attention in your article? Yeah, because that was one of the tweets that, uh, uh, that the Virality Project at, at Stanford Institute Internet Observatory had flagged to Twitter um, as misinformation and that uh, I believe it was labeled or censored in some other way. So it was uh, the Stanford Virality Project that is funded by the, the government, is it not? Yes, it is. And so their purpose, ostensibly, is to stop misinformation, malinformation, and uh, to flag things they say that might be against the terms of service of the uh, social media companies. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Ms. Troy, is, is there any reason you think that this should have been flagged? For Depends on whether you're spreading inaccurate information. Well, it references a study Seems from Israel, a published study from Israel, and the, and the tweet just restates the title of the study. Does it's it trouble you that... companies to review their policies. It's an internal choice. Yeah. Are you, going to, are you going to sit here and maintain that it's a conspiracy theory that this occurred? We have the documents. Mr. Schellenberger has the documents that showed that this occurred. Well, then it was flagged for a reason. What's the reason? Is there ever a good reason to censor a member of Congress? This is my official account. 
This is not a personal account. This is not a campaign account. This is my communication with my constituents. By the way, I bring this up not to, not to claim that members of Congress have more right to free speech than the general public. In fact, I don't even think the press or the media has more rights to the First Amendment than the general public. The general public has the same rights that we have. And I bring this up to show, number one, that your testimony is false. But number two, if they can do this to a member of Congress's official account, they can do it to anybody. Mm -hmm. Now I wanna move on to the origins of these programs. Mr. Schellenberger, can you tell us about the Cyber Threat Intelligence League? Was this a, just a group of uh, vigilantes, uh, concerned citizens? Or was it in any way connected to the government? And what did they, what did they endeavor to do? Yeah, this was, uh, so first of all, it's a, it's a pretty ludicrous uh, founding, which was that this is a group of, it was Israeli, uh, for, so-called former Israeli intelligence, uh, former British intelligence, also working at Microsoft, and others who, who basically said, we're gonna volunteer our services. These are some of the world's greatest cyber, so-called cybersecurity professionals volunteering their services to multi-billion dollar hospital and healthcare organizations whose own IT organizations spend millions of dollars a year on cybersecurity, supposedly volunteering this. This was the premise of the whole thing. It then created this third part that I mentioned. They had physical security, cybersecurity, they added cognitive security, and the people that did that were two UK and US military contractors. This, is, this was one of the most sophisticated, missing, you know, disinformation operations that I've ever seen. I've been involved in progressive causes for over 30 years. I've never seen uh, anything so organized, anything that was so uh, so focused on a particular goal and that had so many people that came from military and intelligence organizations. It gave me the creeps just reading about it. You, you said something along the lines that the, the belief that there's uh, has been social media censorship against conservatives is sort of a figment of conservatives' imagination. Ms. Ms. Wasserman Schultz summarized it as a, as, a, as a red herring, bogus red herring. You're aware of the Missouri versus Biden district court decision that recited evidence that the White House, the FBI, CISA, all engaged in working through the social media companies to conduct censorship. It was preliminarily enjoined. You're aware that the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals has reviewed that, found that the findings of the district court were well supported by evidence and modified and substantially affirmed the preliminary injunction against the government entered by, are you aware of all that? And does it affect your view that all of this is a figment of imagination? I am aware of the decision. I also want to clarify, I, I have not actually did never said that this is a conspiracy. You've not heard that comment from me. So you believe there's, there is censorship going on by means of the I federal will. government on social media platforms, or has been? I can only speak to my experience, and I will say that I've sat in a lot of these interagency meetings with social media companies, and ultimately it was their decision. And I will say that well, when it, content was removed, it was ultimately up to them. Yeah, we followed Yeah, the but process. see, that's, that's what the court has said is the problem, is that the, the agencies have engaged in this subterfuge where they say, well, we want you to make the decision, but they're all over them to the point that their constant involvement makes it government involvement. That's the threat. You've got this guy, we ought to get his name out there for, for folks, Pablo Brewer, you said, a, mil a commander with the Special Operations Command, I believe, at some point, and he's involved in this CTI League, but they got Israeli, you mentioned British intelligent, intelligence, and you say this in part of your report, the authors, and talking about one of their reports, advocated for police, military, and intelligence involvement in censorship across Five Eyes nations, and even suggested that Interpol should be involved. Why is that significant, Mr. Schellenberger? <laughs> Oh, because I mean, the, it's not blind to me, obviously. <laughs> Do it as quickly as you can, because I've got one other thing I really want to get to if we can. Well, because, I mean, our, we, we don't want the police and the military to decide what we can say and, and read. And that's, our, that's what makes our country amazing, is that our founding fathers, they said, speech comes, it's the First Amendment, it comes before government. Where it's not, in, in Europe, the king would decide whether you could say things. We didn't want it that way. We said, we want to decide. Look, I, I can't speak to what's happening here in, in America in terms of the internal political situation here. 
what I can point to is the fact that I come from a country where free expression, the right to express oneself freely, has been under threat. And it happened in a very short period of time. It just happened under 10 years. And, and it's happening all over the world now. It's happening in Ireland. Ireland is about to pass legislation um, which, is, which is among the most, it's one of the most draconian hate speech laws in the world. They're trying to stamp out hate. Um, how does one stamp out hate? It's part of the human condition. And, and, and this is extremely worrying. The government cannot define hate, but yet they have this legislation. What is the Election, election Integrity Partnership? What is it? So the Election Integrity Partnership was, uh, uh, the idea for it came from the Department of Homeland Security's Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security uh, agency. It was a collaboration of four NGOs really led by Stanford Internet Observatory to uh, uh, flag content and urge uh, the social media platforms to censor it in one way or another, whether to take it down or put a label on it or throttle it. Is it fair to say that Secretary Mayorkas and Director Ray lied to Congress when they told Senator Paul that their agency personnel did not target constitutionally protected speech? Yeah, I mean, I think it's fair to say that they misled Congress. Um, I'm, I can't be sure of their intention, but they're wrong that those agencies weren't involved in uh, in demanding censorship by the social media platforms. And, and just briefly, like how 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 were they involved in censoring speech? Well, FBI, I don't want to read your whole article. Just oh, sure. I mean, FBI agents were directly flagging content to Twitter, saying this appears to violate your terms of service. What about this? What about that? Same thing with. DHS staff, and then of course DHS created uh, the Election uh, Integrity Partnership, which then became the Virality Project, which was in the process of dem demanding mass censorship of Americans. And based on them reaching out, a lot of these social media companies then acted on that, like the Hunter Biden laptop, all these different activities, correct? Yeah, absolutely. And you have to remember the context is that this was at a time when the social media companies were being threatened to lose their ability to operate, which is the Section 230. One of the most dramatic instances, which is in the Facebook files, is where the White House is, saying, is demanding that Facebook censor content that they think could lead to people becoming hesitant to take the vaccine. Facebook responded and said that they were removing often true content of vaccine side effects. What was the most alarming thing that you came across during your review of internal Twitter documents? And I have a number of follow-up questions, so keep it short. Sure. Um, thank you for the question. Um, I think the most alarming thing that we, we saw was the regular stream, uh, organized stream of communication between uh, the FBI, uh, the Department of Homeland Security, and the largest tech companies in the country. Uh, they had an organized system for flagging content, uh, not occasionally, but in enormous numbers uh, involving spreadsheets of accounts that ran to the hundreds and thousands. For me, it was seeing the uh, so-called former FBI officials within Twitter uh, and working with a variety, and other groups, including this Aspen Institute, participate in an effort to so-called pre-bunk the Hunter Biden laptop before it was ever published in the New York Post, and then to get it censored uh, by Twitter in violation of Twitter's own terms of service, whose internal staff had concluded that the New York Post tweet had not violated their terms of service, and they censored it anyway. <laughs>